Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mel Levine, and I have the privilege of serving on the board of the Pacific Council. We are very grateful to all of you for being here today to join us for this important discussion with the Honorable Moshe Yalon. Moshe is better known in Israel as Bogey. Everybody in Israel has a nickname, uh, and his is Bogey. So uh, that's how he's known, and, and I will refer to him that way. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and its chair, Rob Satloff, who's here. Washington Institute is co-hosting this event, and uh, Minister Yellon is spending several weeks at the Washington Institute, and that's what brings him here. Uh, Minister Moshe Bogi Yalon is somewhat of an enigma to many of us who closely follow Israeli politics and Middle East issues. He has historically been a hardline right-wing Likud leader who has been a consistently strong supporter of Israel's settlements. It was notable when he argued to effectively ban Palestinians from riding on buses used by Jewish settlers. And during John Kerry's efforts to broker a peace deal with the Palestinians, he famously called Secretary Kerry obsessive and messianic, which led the US to deny him meetings with Vice President Biden and Secretary Kerry when he came to the US. In sum, he has not hesitated over the years to oppose bipartisan US policies which support a two-state solution and to take the US to task. Yet, on June 15th of this year, shortly after resigning as defense minister, while not disavowing those strongly held views, he said in sharply criticizing Prime Minister Netanyahu, quote, at this point and in the foreseeable future, there is no existential threat facing Israel, end quote. And he also stated that Iran's nuclear program, in light of the deal reached between Iran and the P5 plus one powers, does not constitute an imminent existential threat to Israel. In addition, he said it is not the security problems which keep him up at night, but the social and moral problems facing Israel. In his words, quote, the cracks in Israeli society the erosion of basic values, the attempt to harm IDF soldiers and their commanders, end quote, is what keeps him up at night. And he emphasized the importance of Israel's alliance with the United States, which he described as essential to Israel's security and diplomatic needs. This has widely been understood to be tough criticism of the current prime minister's actions and the harm that they have allegedly uh, caused to US-Israel relations. So without further stealing the interrogation by the wonderful Jessica Yellen, I will simply suggest that this forum might help us to better understand Bogey's views on settlements, the two-state solutions, and U.S.-Israel relations. Joining us to moderate this discussion is Jessica Yellen. Jessica is the former Chief White House Correspondent at CNN. Please join me in welcoming Minister Yellen and Jessica Yellen to the Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Mel, for the introduction. And thanks for everybody uh, for being here. For me, it's an uh, honor and opportunity to be here in the Pacific Council in Los Angeles. But we have to learn the lessons of history to my mind in which I believe that when a European leader sought to believe that uh, they will be able to impose the European system in the Middle East, the way of thinking was dominating by wishful thinking and patronism. We know what's good for the Middle Easters. And it was a tremendous mistake. And we faced in the last couple of years another mistake, the idea to democratize the Middle East. And we wish to democratize the Middle East. We believe in democracy. Israel is actually the only democracy, the real democracy in the region. But I don't believe that it's going to happen in the coming future because of certain fundamental elements which we ignore as Western people. In our society, as an example, we sanctify life. In our region, death is sanctified. So how can you talk about human rights women's rights in a society which do not appreciate 
human lives. The issue of accountability, which is so clear and obvious to ourselves, we are accountable for what we, we do, in the Middle East, it's ignored. They blame Israel for the failure, for the miseries, in a way, the minor Satan, America is the great Satan. They are, they are not accountable for anything. So with these two examples, <coughs> to look at the Middle East, it means that as Western like-minded people, it's quite difficult to look at it, to understand it. And this is my point, just to start with. What we do now in Israel, and that's what I did as a defense minister, looking to the situation in a very realistic way, avoiding wishful thinking as well as patronism. I, mean, I don't claim to tell them what is good for them. We might offer ideas like human rights, but not to force them to have democracy by elections. It might be by a long process of education. But we are in a hurry. We want democracy now, and we want peace now, and other things that we want now. It doesn't work this way. And in a sober and realistic way, we manage now in Israel to enjoy a very calm situation, relatively calm situation, security-wise. Certain reservations, the stabbing, the ramming, generating from the Palestinians in, in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, along the borders, against all odds, with the chaotic situation in Syria, peace and quiet in the Israeli side of the Golanites, peace and quiet along the border with Egypt, and then peace and quiet along the border with the Gaza Strip, as a result of realistic policy based on big stick. In the Middle East, you can't survive without using big sticks when it is needed, as well as carrots. And in a broader perspective, to looking to the region, we have succeeded to find room for cooperation, even with the Sunni regimes in the region, with those that we don't share with the peace accords. Why? Because of common interest. And rather than trying to solve the problems, I believe in managing the situation in a realistic way, enhancing our interest on one hand, on the other hand, looking for common interest with all our neighbors. And in a way, we and the Sunni Arab camp today share common interest. I would say for meanwhile, I'm not sure what will be in the future. You can't mention today the term the Israel-Arab conflict. You might be irrelevant. There is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but not the Israeli-Arab conflict. For meanwhile. Why? Because, first of all, we share common enemies. Iran is our common enemy. The Shia radical axis is our common enemy. They declared Hezbollah as their organization, not yet by the European Union, unfortunately. Muslim Brotherhood, our common enemy. For us, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, for them, internal enemy. Global Jihad elements like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, and Nusra, they are called today Al-Fatah. Al-Jabat, <coughs> uh, Al-Fatah, Hisham, whatever. Sunni jihadists, our common enemy. And I claim that when we look at the situation, uh, there is a need for reconsideration of all strategies in the region, first of all, by the United States, looking who are our friends, who are our foes, and especially what are our interests in order to enhance this interest in a sober, realistic way, avoiding wishful thinking and avoiding patronism. First of all, uh, yes, we have a strategic relationship between the United States and Israel. As it was mentioned, it's a cornerstone in our national security. And as Defense Minister, I can testify that we enjoy deep, intimate, uh, very good relationship uh, between the Pentagon and the Ministry of Defense, and of course the U.S. Armed Forces and the Israel Defense Forces and our intelligence agencies for the benefit of the two sides. And we are grateful for it. We don't see alternative to the United States as regard to this kind of strategic relationship between, between us and the United States. But we have reservations. We have disputes. It appears to be on the Iranian issue, 
on what should be done in the region, in Egypt, in Syria, and so forth. And one of the main disputes is about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I personally supported Oslo. Uh, but it was when I didn't, I wasn't aware of the details of Oslo. When I became the head of the intelligence, it was 1995, at the peak of Oslo. Under late Mr. Rabin as Prime Minister and Defense Minister, it was August 95 when I came to the Prime Minister and Defense Minister Rabin in one of our working meetings saying, Mr. Prime Minister, I have to warn you. This is strategic early warning. I don't see any sign for reconciliation on the Palestinian side. I claimed Arafat doesn't prepare his people for coexistence with Israel. In contrary, he prepares them and educating them for jihad, holy war against the state of Israel, against the Jews, and Istishad to become martyrs, homicide bombers. And in this case, I didn't have to use, to use my sophisticated intelligence sources, which I used. I just had to open the Palestinian textbooks to look at the Palestinian educational curricula or to watch the TV programs, especially for the kids. <coughs> if you educate six-year-old kid to hate the Jews, to hate the Israelis, to hate the Zionists, claiming that Palestine is from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, where is the Jewish state? And, of course, Tel Aviv is the biggest uh, settlement. And Jaffa and Acre and, uh, of course, Jerusalem and Haifa, Palestinian town cities. This is a way to prepare the young generation for reconciliation with the Jewish state. And on this conflict, unfortunately, we witness too many misconceptions in the international, political, as well as public discourse. Just a few examples. We don't have time to elaborate all the misconceptions. There are many of them. First of all, what is this conflict is all about? I thought at the beginning, when I supported Oslo, it's a territorial issue. As I sanctified life more than land, I'm ready to give up land in order to reach peace and tranquility, to save lives. But let's look back. I was commanding, I was commander of uh, Judea and Samaria Division 92-93, just a month before Oslo. Oslo was on September 93. In 92, we absorbed seven casualties as a result of terror. In 93, six casualties. After Oslo, 1,500. And if I have to describe in a nutshell what is this conflict is all about, it's not about occupation since 67. It's about occupation since 48. It's about our very existence. It's about their reluctance to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people in any boundaries. So if you don't understand it, you might fail again and again, as we did. We tried. Oslo. We tried Camp David of Barak, and Arafat rejected it. And then Clinton proposal of December 2000, and Arafat rejected it. Then Olmer proposal after Annapolis, and Abu Mazen rejected it. And uh, go so forth and so forth. The objective is not to build a Palestinian state in 67 months. It's to eliminate the state of Israel as a Jewish state. Bad news? But we can manage. That's what I claim. Let's leave us alone. Don't come with another initiative, believing there was, you know, peace is within reach, final settlement. Just put aside, pushing them, the two sides, it will work. It's not going to work. We are so experienced. And my proposal regarding the israeli palestinian conflict, as in one hand, we don't want to govern them whatsoever, I'm not the one who claimed to annex them. I am very glad that they are. the positive outcome of Oslo is a political separation. And they enjoy already political independence. They have their own parliament, government, president, municipalities. They decided to be divided to two different political entities, led by Hamas in the Gaza, we call it Hamastan, and led by the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Fine, we can manage. 
<coughs> but by trying to push us in a way that might be harmful. You know, we succeed in stabilizing the situation. Why? First of all, because they are dependent on us. I don't see full separation between us and the Palestinians. Those who claim high fence will make good neighbors. We have high fence in the, around the Gaza Strip. They overcome it with uh, rockets from above and tunnels from down, from underground. It doesn't work. This kind of uh, high fence making good neighbors, it might be in the United States, but not in the Middle East. <laughs> so, with this in mind and understanding that actually, economically, they are dependent on us. The center of gravity of their economy is in Israel. They are employed by us in Israel, 100,000, 60,000, in the ter territory in Judea and Samaria, in the settlement, Israeli, Israeli industrial zone, subcontractors of Israeli enterprises. Uh, the, the export is to Israel, 90% of it. The shekel is our currency, common currency, not incidentally. They know that they are dependent on us. And then when it comes to infrastructure, we are not anymore deployed in Gaza after the implementation of the disengagement <coughs> plan. We provide them with water, with electricity to avoid humanitarian crisis. So this idea calling for full separation under the slogans, two states for two peoples, Abu Mazen is not ready to say even two peoples. He denies the existence of the Jewish people. He claims Judaism being a religion, it's neither peoplehood nor nationality. So why should a religion have a state? Very interesting. My proposal is let's manage the situation rather than solving it. May I press From you on the this? bottom up. May I press you on this for just a moment? President Obama is weighing his own framework, which clearly is uh, politics that we can put aside. There are, though, people even in Israel who are concerned that the failure to reach an agreement, some sort of peace with the Palestinians, is a mortal threat to the survival of Israel. Do you not agree? Uh, no, I don't agree because, uh, you know, what, what, is, what are the claims? That Israel, in order to keep itself as Jewish and democratic state, should separate, be separated totally with the Palestinians. Now, in the current situation, as I mentioned, I truly support the political separation. And I want them to enhance their capabilities and their competence to govern themselves. I want them as a reliable, accountable neighbor. So they don't have to vote to the Knesset. That is a threat, a demographic threat. We have uh, the Palestinians in Gaza irrelevant to our political situation. They're not going to vote to the Knesset. And we have the Palestinians in, in the West Bank, irrelevant, they vote to the Palestinian parliament. That's fine. Now, they don't threaten us from, you know, uh, uh, giving up the political uh, power. When uh, uh, Abu Mazen threatened uh, a year ago that he was going to throw the keys, I started to laugh. He threatened us with an empty pistol. If he throws the keys now, there will be someone, Palestinian, will take it. If not a Fatah uh, figure, it will be Hamas. It's not a threat. And of course, it's not just political power, it's economic power, so he's not going to give it up. Now, rather than looking for solution, and of course, considering the alternatives, my proposal is to improve the situation, to make progress from the bottom up. Let's improve the economy, the infrastructure, security. They are dependent on us as regard to security. We do most of the job in fighting Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, anywhere, even in the West Bank, in their area of responsibility. They do part of the job. And why we, do we enjoy security cooperation? Because we have common enemies. We both fighting the same enemies, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and Daesh. That's fine. So uh, I'm not afraid from this kind of threat that we, we, we are not solving the problem, it will be a threat for Israel. We are not going to solve it, but we can manage it in a better way. Let's move on to the Iran deal. Although, actually, I want to give you a chance, Mel said in your introduction that you had called Secretary Karen, Kerry messianic and obsessive. Would you like an opportunity to put that in context and give us your true impressions of the senator? 
the Secretary of State. You can also pass. <laughs> you know. Uh, as I mentioned, there are dispute reservations. That's why I'm here for five weeks to try to convince people to go in a realistic way. So let's talk about, very nicely done, what is realistic? <laughs> A number of American leaders have said on the Iran deal that there are even Israeli officials who are now pleased with it, and you've gone on the record to say you don't know one who is. So uh, is there any way in which, let's talk about something practical, this deal can be made into something that you think is positive for Israel? I am one of the officials that uh, you might quote saying that uh, is good news in this uh, deal, but the only good news is that there is a delay on the, in Iranian military and nuclear project. This is the only good news. The entire very bad news, even regarding the nuclear project. You know that the Iranians succeeded in this deal to keep all their indigenous capabilities to produce a bomb. Not now. They can do it now by violating the deal. But within nine to 14 years, they can do it without violating the, the deal. They will be restricted to produce a bomb. And we have to deal with it now, cooperating between US and Israel as common challenge. From our point of view, no way to have a military nuclear Iran by one way or another. This regime, which is, uh, I call it messianic apocalyptic regime, rogue regime, shouldn't have military nuclear capability. And ten, nine to 14 years, it's around the corner. But what about the entire rogue activities of this regime? Ignored? What about proliferation of arms and terror? Not just uh, in the Middle East. Ignored? It's a clear violation of United Nations Security Council resolution. And we have all the evidence on a daily basis. We deliver weapons to the Houthis in Yemen, which is not against us. But they're not allowed according to the UN Security Council resolution. And there is a war in Yemen between the Sunnis and the Shias. The Houthis, the Shias, govern now Sana. What about Hezbollah in Lebanon? armed with more than 100,000 rockets and missiles by Iran. Lebanon has been abducted by this regime in Tehran. The Lebanese government is irrelevant when it comes to make a decision to go to war against Israel or to see the fire. It's up to Khamenei in Tehran. Unbelievable. Lebanon, a member of the United Nations, yes, talking about the international world order, Irrelevant. Hezbollah is a strategic arm of Iran. Ignored? What about terror infrastructure in five continents all over the world ready to challenge, first of all, America, the great Satan? We are lucky to be considered as a minor Satan. <laughs> in North America, in South America, in Asia, in Africa, in, in, in the Middle East, this is this Iranian regime. Ignored? What about the missile project, ready to embrace nuclear warheads? Launching a provocative test just recently. Another violation of UN Security Council resolution. Ignored? If you ignore it, it is a signal of weakness in the Middle East. And there is no room for weakness in the Middle East. And this is one of the disputes that we share. So that's one element which is good news regarding the deal, the entire, unfortunately, bad news. If there are changes to be made in the Iran deal, it would have to be driven by the next president in conjunction with Congress. So would you give us a moment to share your views of both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and their position on Israel to the extent you're comfortable saying how first, you think? First of all, we have to agree that there is negative outcome of the deal. And we have to deal with it by cooperating in order to meet it as a challenge, security challenge, for the stability of the region, for the stability of the entire globe, of course, for uh, uh, 
the security, the safety of our country. And if we agree about it, we can deal with it and with our open channels, how to meet the ch the, this challenge as soon as possible. And it might be by going back to political <coughs> isolation of this regime, crippling economic sanctions, another credible military threat towards the regime to behave himself. Actually, when Khamenei decided to come to the table to be engaged with the Great Satan, the way that he expressed it, he did it because he was in a dilemma whether to go on with a nuclear project or to survive the regime. This is a way to convince such rogue elements in the region, to put them again in such a dilemma. Reconsidering the strategy in the Middle East and, and looking from our region, there is a great frustration among our Sunni neighbors. Let's deal with them. Let's live alone with them. They sought to believe that the United States will be with them, not with Iran. So I'm not sure that uh, the decision has been made here to be with Iran, but this is the impression in the region. Iran is now part of the solution. Why? Because they are ready to fight ISIS, the Sunnis. Of course they are ready to fight the Sunnis. But by doing it, actually, they gain hegemony in the region. They are hegemonic in Beirut. They are hegemonic in, Be in, in Iraq, in a way, with the Shia government. In Sana'a, with the Houthis dominating uh, 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 Sana'a to allow them now to enjoy hegemony in Damascus because they are ready to fight ISIS. This is the future of Syria. This is the future of Israel to have Iranian troops on the border. But from the Sunni regime's perspective, uh, they feel like they are, have been abandoned by the United States. That's one element of, to be reconsidered. Another is about other players in the region. I'm not sure that Russia is on the same page or even on the same boat with US interest in the region. <laughs> what about Turkey, a member of NATO, playing a nasty game? Yeah. Until recently, Turkish government allowed ISIS to benefit from the fact that Turkey bought oil from ISIS to facilitate ISIS. Why they did it? Because they believed that the ISIS might kill the Kurds. This is a first priority. They're not on the same page. With the United States, with Israel, different interests. And <coughs> they allowed jihadists to come from all over the globe to fight in Syria and Iraq and to go back to the countries, especially in Europe, as well experienced terrorists. A member of NATO? We were expecting something else. And if not, to use leverages, Western leverages on, on this government in Turkey. And the way that Europe is Islamized now, we claim deliberately by the Turks. Deliberately. They push not just refugees, illegal, illegal, illegal immigrants coming from all over the Muslim countries, Islamic countries, pushed to Europe, to Islamite. Is it American interest, European interest? So there is a lot to be done as regard of what I call the grand strategy to deal with the situation, managing it, without any illusion that to solve it. Uh, but certain interests should be enhanced according to our priority, not according to contradictory uh, interest uh, uh, of other parties in the region, like I mentioned. Uh, you, looking to Syria, this is the first time since Sadat expelled the Soviets that the Russians are essentially on Israel's doorstep uh, and in the region. What do you think Russia's game is there, and how does it impact Israel's interests? The declared Russian interest, as we heard, are two reasons. One, with the experience of Libya and Iraq, after toppling tyrannical regimes, facing chaos, tribal conflict in Libya, sectarian conflict in Iraq, Russians claim that they are there to support the regime in order to avoid chaotic situations. 
The second explanation is interesting. Uh, they claim that uh, 2,000 uh, Russian spoken jihadists, Chechnys, Caucasus, whatever, are deployed now in Syria, and Putin prefers them to kill them on Syrian soil rather than on Russian soil. But there are certain undeclared interests, hidden agenda. First of all, to come back to the uh, superpowers, ball game, quite successful. Secondly, to direct attention from Ukraine to Syria, quite successful. Ukraine is non issue. Then to use, uh, of course, uh, uh, the current situation in the Middle East to gain influence by claiming that <coughs> we, the Russians, we are loyal to our friends in the region, like Bashar al-Assad, and not like the Americans, abandoning Mubarak, abandoning the Sisi, abandoning the Sunni parties in the region. We are loyal to our friends. Interesting. Then, of course, to have the uh, uh, Tartu seaport to be used by the Russians. It's a Syrian seaport in the Mediterranean. They have now an airport uh, for their um, aircraft and to rehabilitate their intelligence uh, capabilities, facilities in Syria, which they did uh, after they lost it in the civil war. And of course, it's an opportunity to demonstrate and to test their weaponry systems. It's a test field for and an opportunity to demonstrate the military capabilities. Having said that, I don't see uh, the Russian intervention in Syria as, as, as a tool to solve the problem. In a way, it's even facilitate the conflict to be continued. As I don't see the Sunnis, which is the majority, 74% of the population, giving up. So my assessment is, first of all, unfortunately, which is a tragedy, that the war there will go on. Uh, I published an article after reaching the deal with a ceasefire uh, last week that zero chances to succeed. And you know, this is a reality on the ground. You don't have to be profit in the Middle East. <laughs> Any pessimistic uh, prediction is uh, materialized. But nevertheless, it's, it's based on, on the reality. Avoiding wishful thinking, avoiding it. Yeah. You know, I heard that the uh, American uh, objective is to reunify Syria. How come? I know how to make omelet from an egg. I don't know how to make egg from an omelet. <laughs> and this is shakshuka. <laughs> no way. So if you don't have the right Diagnosis, how can you have the right prognosis? And in a way, we have to accept that what we will see in the coming future, Syrian Alawistan, Syrian Kurdistan, Syrian Dordistan, we have to manage it. We are not going to solve it. But let's look to our interests. The way that we look at it, it should be seen in a broader perspective by the United States in order to have a realistic, sober, uh, Policy, strategy, for the benefit for, first of all, U.S. interest. So if we had to rank the challenges, you have some radical Sunni jihadists on some of your borders and radical Shiite jihadists <laughs> elsewhere. Which is the bigger threat and why? Iran. No doubt about it. Iran. You know, we have Daesh on the border in the Golan Heights. We have Daesh uh, on the border in Sinai Peninsula. From the Sunnis in the Golanites, we haven't absorbed a single attack. In the last two years, we absorbed 12 attacks, mostly rockets launching from the Syrian side of the Golanite to our side, perpetrated by Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps proxies, namely Jihad Mourani and Samir Kuntar, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Not a single attack perpetrated by Sunni elements. How come? Two reasons. Actually, German journalists interviewed Daesh uh, leaders in the Syrian side of the Golanites, uh, and they asked them, you know, across the border of Israel, why don't you 
challenge the Israel. Launching rockets, perpetrating terror attacks. The answer was very clear. We don't want to deal with them. It's too dangerous. Deterrence. The second <coughs> reason, it is more complicated to understand. But when we do what we call the red lines for the parties in the, in the uh, Syrian side of the border, all of them, the regime, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, Sunni jihadists, we illustrated very clearly our red lines. And when they violated, as the Iranians did, we used our big stick, effectively, surgically, to eliminate any threat. For meanwhile, the Israelis as Jews, Jews, we couldn't ignore the tragedy across the border. And when we found that the villagers, Sunni villagers, across the border need our help, like medical support, they came to the fence to the border, asking for medical support, women, kids, and injured rebels as well. To cut the long story short, we deployed field hospital on the border. We hospitalized until now about 3,000 Syrians in our hospitals. And after the rehabilitation, the recovery, we sent them back home. And when they asked for food, or for fuel, or blankets in the winter, or whatever, because the road to Damascus was closed, we said, fine, we are ready to support you. We are not, we are not going to intervene. It doesn't mean that we support you as a regime. <coughs> Humanitarian needs, we are going to address. But two conditions for it. First of all, don't allow jihadists to approach our border. It has happened and has happened. And second issue, which is sensitive in our case, don't harm the Druze population on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights, although the Druze in Syria are still loyal to the regime, and you are rebels. Why? Because in Israel we have 100,000 Druze, well integrated in the society, serving in the military, the IDF, don't touch them. And it works. Coming back to the idea of interest, looking for common interest, using the sticks and the carrots, it works. We're going to go to um, questions from the audience in just a minute, so get your thoughts ready. Uh, my last question for you is very few people, if anyone, have held such senior positions in government uh, and then resigned the way you did. And uh, you've publicly said that you will seek some form of public office again. It's uh, believed that you might challenge Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in the next election. Is that your plan? <laughs> in my resignation speech, I claim that I'm taking a political break, but I'll be ready to run to our national leadership in the next elections that I don't know when it's going to take place. Uh, and my, the main reason for my resignation, that it was mentioned, uh, I had uh, too many disputes with my friend in the government and in my party, a Likud party, about keeping our, I would say, moral Jewish values, the rule of law, keeping Israel as Jewish and democratic state, by all means democracy, not losing checks and balances the way that the media in Israel is offended, the Supreme Court is offended, the civil servants are offended. Uh, this kind of dispute, uh, is especially in the last year, uh, were uh, something that, in a way, I couldn't tolerate. And when I realized that uh, <coughs> I, d I will be able to, to, to go on my way as uh, a defense minister, and uh, I, I knew that uh, Netanyahu wanted to replace me. Uh, to be the foreign affairs minister to, to explain policy which I don't believe in, it is not my way, and I decided to resign for a while from uh, politics. But generally speaking about uh, the Israeli people, knowing them very well, you know, uh, I claim that uh, I was in a position, unique position, to know the young generation in Israel. First of all, as my friend, when I were, we were drafted to the military, 18 years old, then as a platoon leader, commanding the young generation, company commander, up to the chief of staff, 
and even the defense minister, and today, even today, I'm going to meet the young generation in the high schools before being drafted into the military. I have to share with them my experience. And I'm encouraged from the young generation in Israel, highly educated, highly motivated. It doesn't mean that all of them. We have this issue with a soldier in Hebron, unbelievable, misbehavior. <coughs> Nevertheless, this is not the majority. The majority, uh, we, have, we can rely on them. And as long as we invest and spend in Israel on education, knowledge and spirit, minds and hearts, knowledge, excellence in knowledge and spirit, Jewish values, uh, Zionist values, uh, I believe that we will have a bright future. We have challenges, you will, you will argue, we will have disputes, but this is a mainstream in Israel, which I believe in. In this regard, uh, believing that there is a need for leadership, I believe in education from the bottom up, leadership from top down, uh, this is my personal challenge for the next round of elections. So just a quick follow-up. If the Likud party no longer reflects your values, might you form a new party? I don't know. All options are open. I'm still a member of the Likud party. Uh, I might cooperate with other parties. You know, in Israel, the main political dispute is not about the economy, really, or about social affairs or values. It's about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's right and left in Israel. I claim it is not right or left, it's right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, if we agree that this is not the main issue of today, as actually this is the case with our Sunni neighbors, they don't perceive the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as the first priority. They have Iran, they have the Shia axis, they have Muslim Brotherhood, uh, global jihad element, and they say, let's be <coughs> alone the Israeli-Palestinian tribe. For me, if this is the case in Israel, there is a room for cooperation between right and left or center or whatever you, you, you might call it, uh, believing that that should be uh, the framework of the next elections, that I believe it is very important. Thank you. That's it for me. Let's take some questions from the audience. One of the most disturbing things I heard you say you was that um, the textbooks for the children in Palestine, you only have to open them to see where this is coming <coughs> from. Um, I truly believe that any change, if it is at all possible, is going to have to come from a new generation. What are the textbooks like in Israel? You know, I have uh, my own kids, I have my own grandkids. I educate them to sanctify life rather than sanctifying death. I, we do not educate our uh, young generation, generally speaking, that the Palestinians have, they don't have rights. Even for self-governing, political independence, whatever you might call it. Of course, we don't educate them to hate Arabs, although we have problems. I don't ignore it. Uh, looking to the soccer games in Israel in certain places, chanting death to the Arabs. I totally condemn it. And this is the mainstream in Israel. <coughs> and in the Palestinian side, <coughs> they promote death. They promote hatred. They promote it. I'm talking about the official educational curriculum and the official media. This is the case. You know, the idea that Shahids are welcomed, they celebrate the death of the terrorists. This is a way to promote peace. Do you know that not a single Palestinian terrorist to murder Jews, Israelis, was convicted for murdering Jews? Not a single one since Oslo. <clears throat> this is a way to educate the young generation. In the last uh, two years, three years, we had two Jewish <coughs> terror attacks, which, you know, to say ter Jewish terror attacks, 
Iran, uh, Arab youngster was burned to death by a group of three Jewish terrorists. In another case, it was a family in Duma. All of us, we condemned it. We brought them to the court. You know the case of the Palestinian side. They pay for the prisoners. And if you kill more Jews, you get more money as your salary. <coughs> the, 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 the families of the Shahid, of the homicide bombers, are paid by the Palestinian Authority. You know, if you ask me what to do with it, any dollar or euro which is given to the Palestinian Authority should be conditioned by education reform as well as stopping financing these terrorists and their families. It should be conditioned. Otherwise, no way for whatever you call it, peace, final settlement, whatever. And there's a great difference between what they do and what, what we do as regard to our education system. Very different. Uh, thank you so much for your candid comments. My question is that uh, you rightly mentioned that in Syria, we cannot, it's not possible to solve the problem, <coughs> but we can manage the situation. In your view, how can you manage the situation in Syria to bring this war to an end? As I mentioned, that uh, I believe the United States should take a position regarding uh, what we call the Sunni moderates in the region. That should have been the case in Syria as well. The best example is with the Kurdish sector. In the beginning, the Kurds were defeated by ISIS. To the point the United States decided to support them. Politically, financially, and militarily. From that point, with of course, with the participation of other Western countries, the Kurds started to defeat ISIS. That should have been the case with the Sunni moderates in Syria. They are there. Not all the Sunnis are jihadists. And they are ready to fight for their cause, not for American interests, for their survivability. And they asked in the past to support them. Recently, they started to get support. Now, you know, at the end, you can't defeat neither ISIS nor the Assad regime, if you want to defeat it, <coughs> without fighting. Actually, as we call it, boots on the ground. But I don't claim and I don't recommend to have Western boots on the ground. It will generate a jihadist. But there are those in the region who are ready to fight, looking to the Sunni coalition in Yemen, led by Saudi Arabia. Ready to fight. It wasn't the case in the past. In the past, they were ready to pay the proxies to fight for them. You think the Saudis would send boots on the ground into Syria now, if asked? I'm not sure that Saudi Arabia, but we have Sunnis over there. Sunni tribes, like the Kurds, they can be supported in order to defeat ISIS. Of course, they want to defeat Bashar al-Assad as well. It's, this is their uh, internal uh, issue. But in this way, actually, you allow those who might be associated with Western interest, and it should be conditioned. If they get support, they shouldn't harm Western interest. Like we did, as an example, with the Sunnis uh, across the border. We provide them humanitarian support by conditioning it with certain conditions. And this is the way to manage it. In the end, I don't see reunification of Syria in the coming future. So we have to get used to have uh, these cantons, might be with cooperating with each other, might be fighting each other, I don't know. But this is the only way to manage the situation, but not allowing external forces like Iran, Turkey, and even Russia to be involved in contradictory interests to what we believe are Western interests in the region. Uh, hi. Uh, you made some allegations, baseless allegations, about Islamization in Europe and Turkey supporting ISIS and uh, Turkey sending uh, illegal immigrants from Muslim countries for the Islamization of Europe. 
So Turkey have been committing to the NATO principles and for the first time in years, uh, since the efforts of last month, NATO doesn't have a border with ISIS. Uh, Turkey also spent uh, more than 12 uh, billion American dollars on uh, Syrian refugees and also struck a deal with Euro EU in order to keep the illegal immigration in check and also receiving no, uh, no, not much help from uh, European Union or other countries and they're trying to manage the situation of illegal immigrants uh, with mostly their own terms. What's and the question? Uh, so the question is, what are you basing your allegations of Islamization in Europe where there's a clear rise in the uh, hate crimes against Muslims? And also, what are you basing your allegations about Turkey supporting ISIS and sending illegal immigrants to Europe? Well, there is a clear uh, uh, consensus otherwise. You know, the fact that uh, Turkey supported ISIS, that uh, it was clear evident. Buying oil from ISIS and, of course, allowing jihadists to come in and out from uh, Syria and Iraq. It was well known. Uh, we have hard evidence about it. And uh, at a certain point, I believe that the Turkish government was threatened or uh, warned by the U.S. and they changed it in a way. Regarding the Islamization of Europe, I'll tell you about my visit to Greece. I've been to Greece eight months ago. I was briefed by the Greek defense minister, saying that in the year 2015, more than 800,000 illegal immigrants, part of them refugees from Iraq and Syria, but not most of them, reach the Greek islands in the Aegean Sea, coming with rubber boats, five miles or whatever, sailing from the Turkish shore, reaching the Greek islands, actually reaching Europe. <coughs> and he told me a story, one of the stories, about Moroccan guy, 22 years old, coming with this kind of rubber boats from the Turkish side, Morocco is not in the state of war, as far as I know. So he's not a refugee of war, he's an illegal immigrant. When he landed to the, the uh, Greek island, the first act was taking selfie with his iPhone, send it, sending it to his friends and relatives in Morocco to encourage him to follow him in reaching Europe, the new America. The second question, as I, I was told was, where can I recharge my iPhone? <laughs> They're not a refugee of war whatsoever. And they told me that they gave a list of more than 1,200 Turkish smugglers as part of the Turkish system to smuggle these Muslims coming from Morocco, Pakistan, Afghanistan, whatever, African countries, sharing it with the Turkish intelligence to stop it. And they face denial. It doesn't exist. Now, I told them that I'm very experienced with this kind of phenomena. Why? Because we claimed for years that when Hamas terror headquarters had to move from Damascus to someone, somewhere else, they moved to Istanbul. And we had and still have Hamas terror headquarters operating from Istanbul, trying to push, encourage, perpetrate, operate terror attacks against us in the West Bank. And when we claimed it, we faced denial. It doesn't exist. So this is the case. Now, what are the intentions of this government, of this president in Turkey, you have to judge it. <coughs> but for me, it's a liberate operation to Islamize Europe. The question is essentially, you've talked about managing the situation with Iran, but when it's a threat of a nuclear Iran, how is that managed? And are you, would you support some sort of attack in order to, quote, help with the management? Is that fair? As I said, uh, 
by one way or another, the military nuclear project of Iran should be stopped. Military option, anyhow, is the last resort. You know, I have quite experience regarding wars, and as a result of it, I'm aspiring for peace, and uh, you use the military power when other alternatives have been exhausted. That's why I call for coordination and cooperation now in order to prevent the military nuclear Iran, first of all by other means. But at the end, Israel should be ready to defend itself and lie itself. Whether it is regarding Iran, whether it is regarding other parties in the region <coughs> acquiring to have uh, non-conventional capabilities uh, with the intentions to wipe Israel off the map of the earth. They claim it. But we have to ask ourselves uh, another question regarding the Iranian regime. We don't share border with Iran. They don't claim that you, you, we occupy Iranian soil whatsoever. And they call to wipe Israel off the map of the earth. How come? And this is a challenge. When you have such rogue regime with ideology which combined of religious, political interest, strategy, but generally speaking, gaining hegemony in the region. This is the main issue. This is a new imperialism in the region, whether it is perpetrated by the Iranian, calling it exporting the revolution and gaining hegemony, the Sunni Wahhabis claiming to have a, a, a caliphate, an Islamic caliphate, and even Turkey with the Muslim Brotherhood ideas to have the influence in the region their way. Uh, the most dangerous element in this regard for Israel is Iran. They are ready to sacrifice, they were ready to sacrifice in order to have nuclear capability. I believe that they'll be ready to sacrifice even to pay by the sanctions. It was quite a sacrifice for them in order to reach such capabilities. That's why this is the main threat for stability in the Middle East. This is the main threat for Israel. This is the main threat for the Western civilization. They claim to impose a way of Islam, not just in our tough neighborhood in the Middle East. Aspirations are global. That's why we should coordinate our activities with the United States as soon as possible in order to meet the challenge <coughs> for the benefit of our two countries. Minister, thank you for your time and for sharing your perspective. Thank you. Thank you.